வணக்கம் டுடே வி ஆர் கோயிங் டு சி அ வெரி வெரி இம்பார்ட்டன்ட் செக்ஷன் ஆஃப் இன்கம் டேக்ஸ் ஆக்ட் ஆஃப் நைன்டீன் சிக்ஸ்டி ஒன் தட் இஸ் செக்ஷன் whether this section is going to affect the trade or whether it is going to affect the industries or the business as a whole this is a very very important section of income tax act of 1961 we are going to discuss about this section this uh, let us go point by point where is the importance has taken place this, because this section 43 bh has been introduced by the finance minister in the finance act of 2023 it gives life to section 43 bh this section is being given or introduced by the finance minister because of the msme development act of 2006 and wherein lot of conditions have been given in order to support the msme units and this section comes into effect from 14 2023 that is applicable for the financial year 2023 24 or the applicable for the assessment year 2024 25 that is from 14 2023 this section is applicable to all the traders to the all the ms msme units and all the business and the method of accounting is very very important to the applicability in order to apply, uh, in order to make the applicability of uh, section 43 bh method of accounting is very very important that is few customers they follow the mercantile system and they follow the cash system and this is applicable for the financial year concept and what's the important words that they are given in section 43 bh when you go into the definition of 43 bh we'll see the following important terms and uh, the conditions uh, one is uh, any sum payable any sum payable and second one is by the ssc and it is applicable to micro and small enterprise it is applicable to micro and small enterprise and this that as per the time limit specified in section 15 of the msme act so section 15 of msme act specifies the time limit and deduction is allowed only in the previous year that is where the amount has been paid that previous year has to be taken into account and the sum has actually been paid so the sum payable has to be actually paid and the deduction from the income tax is allowed in the financial year in which the payment is made and the time limit has been specifically mentioned in section 15 of the msmed act let us go about the any sum payable that is it is applicable for the revenue expenditure as well as to the capital expenditure which has been debited in the payroll account here the depreciation is not to be considered for the purpose of uh, the applicability of section 43 bh and assessee overall assessees here that we have to see individual hof firm company including llp body of individual aop society or trust local authority every artificial juridical person not falling in any of the preceding category all are called as assessee uh, in order to arrive at the applicability of section 43 bh of the income tax act let us go to the definition of the micro enterprise small enterprise and medium enterprise this is very very important micro enterprise you can uh, define based on the investment in plant and machinery that is up to 1 crore not exceeding 1 crore in the investment and plant and machinery it is called as micro enterprise and the turnover that is up to not not exceeding 5 crore if the turnover is not exceeding 5 crores if the investment in plant and machinery is not exceeding 1 crore then that should be called as the micro enterprise and small enterprise that is not exceeding 10 crores and in the turnover it is not exceeding 50 crores and with reference to medium enterprises if the turnover is not exceeding 50 crore and the uh, turnover sorry investment in plant and machinery is not exceeding uh, 50 crore and turnover is 250 crore so this is called as medium enterprise and for this this provision is applicable only for the micro enterprise it is not applicable for the medium enterprise it is not applicable for the medium enterprise and also it is not applicable for the traders 
So MSME benefit, MSME benefit of section, MSME the Act of 2006, the benefit of section 15, that is uh, applicable only for the micro and the small enterprises. And it is not applicable for the medium enterprises and traders. Here they say that a turnover up to 50 crore and investment in plant and machinery or equipment up to uh, 10 crore are eligible to be to get the benefit of uh, the section 43 BH of the Income Tax Act of 1960. We'll go uh, in detail. Are you a buyer of goods or service recipients from MSME? If you are a buyer or the service recipient from the MSE, then the provisions of section 43 BH is applicable. And are you a seller of goods or service provided to MSME? Suppose if you are selling to MSE, then, then the benefits that is, as a trader, you are not entitled to get the benefit of Section 43 BH. In case, if the medium enterprise buys goods from the, uh, or receives the service from MSC, then Section the 43 BH provisions are applicable. And in case, if the medium enterprise buys goods and receives the services from the trader, then provisions of Section 43 BH is not applicable. In case the trader buys a goods from uh, receives service from MSE, yes, 43 BH is applicable. And in case if the MSE buys goods from another MSE, then the then there also the provision of section 43 BH is applicable. For you, sometimes few persons they do both trading activity as well as the manufacturing activity. So the with reference to the uh, trader, if you are a trader, if you are buying a goods from MSC, then 43 BH is applicable. If you are a manufacturer and if you are buying the goods from a trader, then 43 BH is not applicable. So this is a very, very uh, important thing that you have to know basically before understanding the provisions of, uh, provision of the entire section. Here, in the middle, it is called as a trader. This trader buys the goods from the MSE. So if the, if the trader has to make the payment to the MSE units within the time limit mentioned by section 15 of the MSME Act of 2006, then this trader sells the goods to MSE, then this trader sells the goods to trader. Then this trader has got no right to avail has got uh, when has got no right to make the complaint to receive the money from the MSC or trader provided the trader sells the goods to the trader or MSC. What is Section 15 of MSME Act? It specifies that that says there should be terms of agreement between the buyer and seller in order to sell the goods in order to provide the services. And it mandates that the buyer from the MSC has to make the payment within the agreed date. That is, that if there is any agreement, and in that agreement, if any date is mentioned, then that is called as agreed date. And in case there is no agreement between the buyer and seller, then the payment has to be made on the appointed day. We will, uh, we will uh, discuss about the agreed date or appointed date. Whichever is earlier. Suppose in the agreement, the buyer has to make the payment within 60 days or 45 days. The MSME is access, even though you have agreed for 60 days, whichever earlier is applicable, then the buyer has to make the payment within 45 days. This is very, very important. So that is the with the reference to the agreement. Suppose if the agreement date is within 30 days, then the trader has to make the payment to MSC, then 30 days. In case if the agreed date is 60 days, then the maximum date is 45 days. So within 45 days, the trader has to make the payment to the MSC units. Now, in order to arrive at the agreed date identification, specific purchase order is should be there. It will be clearly mentioned. In few cases, it will be clearly mentioned in the invoice. And sometimes uh, these dates have been mentioned through the mail or sometimes through the advertisement given in the newspaper. 
So all this will be there in order to arrive at the agreed date. And what is the agreed date and the appointed date? So if there is any return agreement, the payment has to be made within 45 days. Then that is called as agreed date. So agreed date has to be clearly mentioned in the return agreement. And if there is no agreement, then the payment has to be made within 15 days. And if the payment has not been made within 15 days, then the next day to the 15 is called as appointed day. So the section 2B defines the appointed day as the day immediately following the expiry of 15 days prior to the day of acceptance or deemed acceptance of goods or services by the buyer from supplier. Here, we have to understand the definition of the day of acceptance or deemed acceptance of goods. What is this? That we will see. See, for the purpose of this class, the day of acceptance is, is is not the day of preparation of the sale invoice. It The act clearly says the day of actual delivery of goods or rendering the services. It is not the day of preparing the invoice. The Actually, the goods reaches the buyer. That is called as actual delivery of goods. In case, after the receipt of the goods, if the buyer is not convinced with the quality or quantity or some defects is there, in the supply of goods, then the buyer has to make the complaint to the seller, that is MSC unit, within 15 days of the receipt of the goods, within the 15 days of the delivery of the goods, then these mistakes have to be rectified. These complaints have to be rectified by the supplier. Then after the rectification, if the goods have been sent by the MSC units to the trader, then the date of delivery by the trader after the rectification is called as the day of acceptance. So day of acceptance, when you calculate the day of acceptance, actual delivery of the goods. If it is in good, then that is the day of, uh, the, the, if it is good at the time of delivery of the goods, then that is called as day of acceptance. If it is not there and if there is any complaint, then you have to exclude all the complaint date, that is rectification date. Then after rectification, the goods have been received by the uh, buyer, that is trader, then that is the day called as the day of acceptance. In case there is no objection, if there is no objection, then that means the day of receipt of the goods is called as the day of deemed acceptance. Let us see from the example. What is the day of acceptance? In the first example, the actual delivery date is 38.23. And uh, there is no objection by the buyer to the seller. So the day of acceptance is 38.23. And point number two, 38.23 is the actual delivery. And there is an objection. And this objection has to be made on or before 4.9.23. Uh, on a, that is uh, this objection within 15 days he has to make so within 15 days means uh, 1 plus 4 that is before 14 9 23 the objection has to be made but actually the objection has been made within 15 days that is on 4 9 23 so the these objections have been rectified by the seller on 15 9 23 so with reference to point number two the actual uh, day of acceptance is 15 9 2023 Point number three, 10, 12, 23 is the uh, actual delivery. There is no objection. So the day of acceptance is 10, 12, 23. Point number four, the 10, 12, 23 is the actual delivery. But the complaint is made beyond 15 days. Beyond 15 days. That is, the complaint has to be made within, uh, 15, uh, within 15 days. That is, 25, 12, 23 but they made the complaint on 30, 12, 23. So here, the day of delivery, the day of acceptance is 10, 12, 23 because the complaint has been made after 15 days. Here, day of deemed acceptance. Deemed acceptance means there is no complaint. So 15, 5, 23, point number one, the day of deemed acceptance is 15, 5, 93. But in point number two, there is a complaint. So that date should not be taken into account and it that date should not be treated as day of deemed acceptance. So here day of, accept, day, day of acceptance concept comes into the picture. 
point number three, 3124 is the day actual delivery, but there is no objection. So the day of deemed acceptance is 31, 2024. You just go through the chart very carefully so that you can easily understand the concept, words of day of acceptance, day of deemed acceptance. Here, the financial year in which the payment is made has to be considered. Suppose if the payment of 23-24 has been made on 24-25, then the direction will be allowed only in the financial year in which the payment has been made. Payment is due in this financial year, but paid in the next financial year, then payment can be claimed as expenditure only in the financial year in which the payment is made. Here, the transaction took place in the current financial year, but the payment is due in the next financial year, but before the due date of uh, the before the due date, the party has made the payment to the seller. Then the deduction can be claimed in the current financial year. In case if the payment is being delayed and paid late in the next financial year, then the deduction can be uh, claimed only in the next financial. We can see this by way of this chart. So point number one, the transaction date is fifteen one twenty four. The due date of the uh, load is uh, 45 days. Let us say that it's an agreed date. It is an agreed date. 29-12-24. Instead of the, that means the transaction which took place on 15-1-24, the payment has to be made on 29, on or before 29-2-24, but the party has actually paid the payment on 15-2-24. So this point number one, the deduction is allowed in the financial year 23-24. Point number two, for uh, the due date of uh, 29 to 24, the payment has been made in the on 15 3 24, but before the end of the financial year 23 24, so the deduction is allowed on I mean, this is allowed for the financial year 23 24. Point number three, the due date is 29 to 24, but the payment has been made on 1 4 24, that is the, the next to financial year. So the eligible deduction is 24, 25 only. You can claim it as expenditure. Point number four, the due date is 29 to 24, but the payment is being made by the party to the seller on 4, 6, 24. So the deduction is allowed for the financial year 24, 25, because only in the next financial year, the payment is made after the due date. So point number five, the due date is 29, 4, 24, but the payment has been made before 26-4-24. Here, the transaction took place on 15-3-24. The 45 days concept ends on 29-4-24. So the, but the payment has been made before the due date. So the eligible deduction is 23-24. In that year, you can claim the expenditure. You can claim the expenditure. Point number six, the due date is 29-4-24, but the payment is being made after 29-4-24. So as per the concept of 43-BH, the deduction will be allowed only for the financial year 24-25. I think you can easily understand. The concept is before the due date, you have to make the payment. In case if you delay the payment and the payment has been made in a particular financial year, then you can claim the expenditure. Suppose if the payment is made in the next financial year, for this year, you are not entitled for the income tax exemption, income tax deduction. You'll be entitled only for the next year. And now it is appointed date. Appointed date means it is 15 days. So here the due date is 1324. The appointed date is the next day following the due date, that is 2324. The payment has been made on 29224. So you are eligible for the deduction for the year 2324. In point number two. The due date, appointed date is 29-3-24, but the party has made the payment on 5-4-24. So the, it is eligible for the deduction for the year 24-25. Point number three, instead of, uh, that is 29-3-24 is the appointed day. Party has made the payment on 27-3. So the deduction can be claimed in the financial year 23-24. Point number four, the appointed date is 7-4-24. That is the due date. The due date which falls in the next to date, next to financial year, but the party has made the payment before the appointed date. So the eligible deduction is applicable for the year 23-24. Point number five, the appointed date is 7-4-24, but the party has paid 
the amount uh, belatedly on 9424. So the applicable uh, eligible year is 2425. Point number six. It is appointed date is 7823, but the party has made the payment in the next financial year. So the eligible deduction for this is 2425. So this is the difference between the appointed date and agreed date. So agreed date is as per the agreement. From that, you have to add 45 days in the appointment date. That is, um, the payment has to be made within 15 days and 16th day is called as appointed day. And in case if there is any delay in making the payment, interest has to be charged. Then the buyer has to make the payment on the due date. If the buyer make, fails to make the payment within this time limit, then the act says, MSMED act says, the borrower, that is the buyer has to make the payment to the supplier on compound interest basis and particularly the interest rate is three times of the normal interest rate as fixed by the RBI. If the interest rate is 6.25, then the borrower has to pay 18.75% on compound basis to the buyer, to the seller by the buyer. So here this is very, very uh, important, but interest paid will not be allowed as a deduction because it is in the nature of penalty. So it is not, it will not be allowed as a deduction in computation of the income of a year. So this is very, very important. So you are to pay, sell, buyer has to make the payment to the seller on the due date. If it is not paid, then the buyer has to pay the interest at three times of the RBA rate fixed on compound interest basis. And this interest will not be allowed as a deduction. They will not be allowed as a deduction in the Income Tax Act of 1961. And interest has to be paid even if there is a delay in the uh, financial year. If there is any delay in making the payment in the during the financial year also, the interest has to be paid. But this interest applicability is a condition that is there in the MSMED Act. It is not there in the Income Tax Act of 91. As per the MSME Act, if the borrower, if the buyer pays the interest, then that interest can, has to be paid at the rate of three times of the uh, interest, the three times of the uh, uh, RBA rate that you have to pay, make the payment to the thing. Here, can the interest levy is mandatory? It is not that clearly in the Income Tax Act. The Income Tax Act says that if the payment is not being made, then it will be disallowed on the due date. And the interest has to be paid as per the uh, terms as mentioned in the MSME Act. So it is not mandatory in the, according to me, it is according to me, it is not mandatory in the Income Tax Act, but it is mandatory in the MSME Act if the supplier makes a complaint under MSME Act. So can the interest levy can be weighed by the supplier? It is, uh, it is the, if there is any complaint, then only this interest levy concept comes into the picture. Again, this is also my view. And in case if it is uh, no a complaint is being made, then interest cannot be, uh, there is no concept of uh, making the interest waiver. And whether the TDS is uh, to be paid on the delayed interest. Since the interest, delayed interest is not to be treated as an expenditure, because you are going to entirely disallow the expenditure, because it is not an expenditure related to PNL account. So any disallowed expenditure, no TDS is required to be made. This is also according to my view. Interest calculation from which date? You have to calculate the interest after the date as per the agreement or day that is on the appointed day. From the appointment day, you have to calculate the interest till it is being paid. So here, the very, very important point that you have to bear in mind is that there is a provision, there is a section called 43B of the Income Tax Act. The 43B of the Income Tax Act from point number A to G, section A to G says that even though the payments are not being made during the financial year, in, but the assessee has made the payment before filing the income tax returns, then that, ex, that payment is allowed in the respective financial year. Suppose uh, for 23-24, for 
there is a tax duty levy and it is not paid on or before 31 3 24 but it has been filed it has been paid before filing the income tax return say on 31 7 or 39 or 30 11 then this is allowed but with reference to 43 bh the benefits of 43 b a to g is not applicable for the payment to the micro and small enterprise because even though you made the payment before filing the income tax return, these benefits are not applicable. What's the implication? That is, if it is a capital expenditure and if it is also a debit in PNL account, the benefits of 43 BH is allowed. And depreciation, against the depreciation, you cannot claim the benefit of section 43 BH. GST implication, it is very, very simple. If you debit the GST as an expenditure in PNL account, then provisions of section 43BH is applicable. In case, if you treat the GST as input credit and put it in the balance sheet, then provisions of section 43BH is not applicable. So this is a very, very important thing that you have to bear in mind. Next one is the applicability of wholesale and retail traders. The Ministry of MSME say that the traders are also entered to look at the UDM registration. This <coughs> benefit is applicable to treat the uh, industry, that is traders as the priority sector lending purpose only. And the other benefits are not av available with reference to delayed payments benefits. They have not been extended to the traders in case if there is, <coughs> they say that these delayed payments have not been extended and it has been clearly explained or clarified by the Ministry of MSC on 1-9-2021. And 43BH, hence the 43BH is not applicable to wholesale and retail traders as the delayed payment provisions are not applicable. So traders cannot make a complaint to under the MSME Act, though they have obtained uh, the benefits of uh, UDM registration, they are not entered to, to avail the benefits of Section 43BH. Is UDM registration mandatory? It is discretionary as per the MSME Act, but to make the complaint under Section 43BH, UDM registration is must. It mandates UDM registration in order to claim the benefits by the supplier. Here one has to remember, though on the date of supply, on the date of supply, if the supplier is holding the UJM registration, then the provisions of section 43 BH is applicable. Now this is clearly stated in Supreme Court in Silphy Industries versus Kerala State Road Transport Corporation. It has been held that the enterprise should be registered on the date of supply for availing the delayed payment benefits under MSME. That is today he has billed, at the time of billing the uh, goods, he, uh, this unit is not registered under MSME Act. That is, and he has not availed the, he has not got the UDM registration. Then after that, in order to avail the benefit of section 43BH, this unit has registered under UDM registration. The Supreme Court say that the trans, whenever you want to avail the benefits of Section 43BH on the date of supply, you should have UDM registration. Otherwise, you are not entitled for the benefit of Section 43BH. So, in few cases, today they surrendered the UDM registration because due to some extraordinary forces, few traders, few sellers, now they started to surrender the uh, UDM registration, even if it is there, then on the date of supply, if the sub, if the MSC units, they are holding UDM registration, they are entitled for the benefits of section 43BH. <laughs> for cash system, uh, following assesses, these provisions are not applicable. And in case if there is any dispute, this is also the section says, if there is any dispute, you have to exclude the 
dispute period. Few persons now they started to take the shelter by way of getting the dispute letter in the I mean predated dispute letter they used to get in order to avoid uh, the payment on the due date. So they say that this has to be made by the buyer to the seller within 15 days. That is the complaint has to be made by the buyer to the seller within 15 days. Till the dispute is settled, those days have to be excluded uh, from the 45 days or 15 days. And few customers, they took the shelter under this dispute category. But this is not advisable. And regarding the presumptive tax, these provisions of section 43 BH is not applicable. If any associate avails the or files a return under uh, presumptive taxation concept, then these provisions of section 43 BH is not applicable. So this point you have to bear in mind. Next concept is for MAT concept. These provisions of section 43 BH is not applicable because 43 BH do not directly apply to MAT calculation as MAT has its own set of rules and considerations. So this point you have to bear in mind with reference to MAT. So disallowance specified in 43 BH for regular assessments are not mirrored in MAT computation. Then this is the highlight of uh, MAT and section 43 BH. Now, whether the provision of section 43 BH is applicable to the charitable trust, yes. If you file the return under section 11 to 30, then provisions of section 43 BH is not applicable because in that case, those charitable, uh, trans, uh, those charitable institutions, they are not doing any business. In case, due to some uh, business nature, some charitable institutions, they are doing some business. So that is applicable. In case the trust is doing any business, then for the business portion, Section 43 BH is applicable for the for the non-profit organizations. This provisions of Section 43 BH is not applicable for trade registration. Trade registration one can have only when the turnover is above 500 crores, above 500 crores. So this concept of trade registration is not applicable for the provisions of Section 43 BH. So this is a very uh, simple chart. So if you are uh, if you are not uh, if you are not registered under the same portal, then Section Forty Three BH is not applicable. In case if you are a trader, then provisions of Section Forty Three BH is not applicable. If you are a medium enterprise, there also the provision of Section Forty Three BH is not applicable. And if you are a manufacturer or service provider, then you will be called as the micro or small enterprise if it is or if it is applicable. And if there is any return agreement, the payment has to be made within a period of 45 days. And if there is no agreement, then the payment has to be made on, from the 16th day onwards. That is, within 15 days, he has to make the payment. And if it is not made, then the payment has to be made on the 16th day. That is called as appointed day. Here, what is the role of the auditor? This is very, very important. The auditor has to take the list of their creditors with the age of the creditors at the year end, say 31 3, 24. You have to eliminate the opening creditors. You have to eliminate the opening creditors and analyze the payment between 1, 4, 23 onwards to all the creditors and bifurcate the purchases and services from MSME, MSE units and traders. You have to bifurcate the purchases and services well, what is the what is the bills purchased? What's the services got from the MSC units or traders? You have to bifurcate. And is there any disputed creditors? That list also you have to get from the as an auditor, you have to get from the SSC. And out of the total creditors, as on 31 3, 24, detect the opening creditor, trade creditor, disputed creditor, in order to arrive at the calculate, not arrive at the age of the creditor as per the provisions of section 43 BH of the Income Tax Act of 1961. And next one is ask the assessees to produce the copies of them registration certificate from the MSC creditors. Ensure that MSC creditors, MSC creditors, they are having them registration on the date of supply. 
date of supply. That is very, very important. It is not the date of preparation of invoice. It is date of supply. So prepare the list of payments made to the creditor during the year and see that there is no delay in settling the MSA. So this time the auditors are having very big role to uh, because you have to go and analyze the payment on bill wise. That is a very, very important thing. Next one is in case if there is a delay in payment of each invoice, then as the auditor has to arrive at the number of days delay in order to calculate the interest payment as per the MSMEDR because this is also the thing that you have to give in the tax audit report. Next one is calculate the calculate all those interests on compound interest basis. And that is three times. See that the penalty interest is not allowed as an expenditure while arriving at the p and account. So this is uh, while arriving at the profit of the concern. This is very, very important. Auditor has to call for the complaint list made in the MSMED Act by the MSC unit supplier against SSC, and he has to analyze the position. Then auditor has to verify whether any interest is weighed by the supplier. If that is there, then the auditor has to give a specific comment in his report. Next one is the auditor has to see about the GST effect on section 43BH. Then he has to analyze each and every expenditure debited in trading and profit P and L account other than the depreciation, other than the depreciation. And the auditor has to prepare a overall disallowance under section 43BH and uh, he has to report the same accordingly in the audit report. Then the auditor has to arrive at the day of acceptance, day of deemed acceptance, agreed date, appointed date, bill wise. So this is a very, very big headache for the auditor. He has to arrive at the, that is he has to prepare, he has to take all the invoices and he has to prepare the bill wise. And he has to check the interest claim made by the MSC units and confirm the working okay. next uh, important role is that discuss with the client that i am going to report this this is also very very important next point the auditor has to see that the tax effect because of this disallowance what is the tax effect that he has to see then he have to you have to educate the client with reference to tax planning under section 43 bh so this is a very, very important thing that is an auditor has to educate the client. In case of the company, the auditor has to verify whether form MSME 1 was filed with the MCA on half yearly basis. That point also he has to see. Then upward classification has to be, that means every year the auditor has to see whether the uh, whether the seller is remaining, I mean, he is remaining in the same category of micro or small enterprise, or whether he has moved to the medium enterprise, every point then the auditor has to verify. That is, every year the auditor has to call for the, uh, has, to, uh, has to call for the um, uh, medium, uh, has to call, verify the medium enterprise. So, of course, classification has to be verified by the auditor. Now, we are coming to the very important area of tax audit report. Initially, they introduced, CBD has issued a notification on 5324, by amending class 26, but it has got, uh, it is not serious, but there are a lot of loopholes out there. Later on, there is another amendment has been issued on, that is corrigendum has been issued to the amendment on 19324 by amending the class 22 of form 23 CD. And he has also amended the section under, that is 26, under 26, they are also amended the uh, section class 22. That is initially they included 43 BH in section for class 26. Later on they amended section 22 and in that section they say that you have to give a consolidated report of consolidated report of delayed payment that you have to give in the tax audit report. The tax auditor need not report the breakup but report the disallowance of payments in full. So if the auditor says that it is a full disallowance, then automatically it is very easy for the department to disallow the expenditure. Next one is there is no prescribed format in reporting the amounts disallowable. Only the total amount disallowable has to be reported and no individual breakup is required. Then the tax auditor has to give in his opinion on the disallowable working. Tax authorities has to verify whether the payments due to MSE are otherwise admissible in terms of Section 30, 37, 1 and not liable for disturbance as per the explanation given below Section to Section 37, 1 or Section 40 or Section 40A. 
So if there is any disrelevance in the other section, then 43BH is not up. Then another important point is for disallowed expenditure, very simple concept. If there is a disallowed expenditure, then section 43BH is not applicable. Then report in delay payments, but payments, you have to report only the delay payments. In case if the payment has been delayed, barely delayed in payment mode is means delayed in the next year and they paid in the next year, that is immaterial because you are going to issue the certificate only for the financial year ending 31, 3, 24. In case if the payment is being made on 15, 5, 24, you need not worry at all. Next one is there is no need to report the delayed payment on or before 31, 3, 24, but the interest working has to be reported by the charter accountant. In case if it is a cash system or maintaining, the auditor need not report anything. This is a very, very important thing. And now what's the tax planning and doubts? Few people say that, sir, can say, uh, there is an opening to us. Besides, we also uh, got some uh, payment during the, we also got some goods during the year. So whatever may the, whatever be the payment that I made to the creditor, instead of adjusting the opening credit us, can we adjust the purchases which we have made during the financial year? The concept is no. The payment has to be made to the creditors and the adjustment should be made on the FIFO basis and not LIFO basis. And sometimes few customers say that, sir, we have made the payment, we have issued the check. But indirectly they say that if they lost the supplier, sir, don't put the check for collection. We have made the payment on the due date. You kindly hold the check. Whenever we have got the money, we'll ask you to put the check for collection. This is also uh, the one of the tax planning. Few customers now, they started to do it. So that is, they issued the check on due date. So as per the norms, the payments have been made on due date. But the party has not put the check for collection. So it is the party's uh, right to put the check for collection. So according to me, we made the payment on the due date. So this is also another move. And sometimes they, few customers, they want to took the shelter by way of getting the dispute letter on the anti-date. So on pre-date, in pre-dated dispute letters, few customers now they started to get in order to, our, I mean, in order to avoid the compliance under section 43 BH. And Few customers ask the supplier to surrender the Udayam registration. This is a very, very dangerous thing. Because the supplier would have availed their loan from the bank uh, by treating them as the priority sector, they would have availed the interest concession. If the supplier has surrendered the Udayam registration, then they will be losing the right of climbing the priority sector and their loans have to be paid on the higher interest. So this is also another planning. And next one is get a letter from the MSC that we will not make any complaint under MSC media. Is it correct? This is also not correct. This is also not correct. They say that you cannot prevent a person in going and approaching the law. I will not make complaint. So it is only a temporary thing. But when you produce this letter before court of law, court they will never agree. According to me, according to me, they go, they will never agree because you cannot prevent anyone from availing the benefits of the loss of the country. You cannot prevent. In, because in order to make the payment, you are forcing the customer to issue the letter like that. So any letter obtained by the buyer by way of indirect force of non-payment of funds, then that letter also is not valid. And this is what I want to say with the reference to section 43 big hatch. It's a ocean. It's a very, very important section. Please go through it. And you have got a lot of uh, opportunities in 43 big hatch uh, section. I mean, all the auditors, they've got a lot of uh, very big headache. When we can, we have to pay a lot of time to give the report. We have to verify each and every invoice whether all the invoices are eligible for 43BH, everything that we have to see. So this is what I want to say with reference to this provision of section 43BH. And thank you very much for the patient hearing. Nandri, Vanakam.